Hello and a very big welcome to Festival of the Child, a global online summit empowering parents and educators to help children thrive. I'm just thrilled to welcome you here. Whether you're joining us here on the live broadcast or listening in on the replays, the fact that you're here tells me that you care passionately about your children. Over the course of these seven days, we will be listening to transformative conversations with teachers, educators, psychologists, storytellers, and many more wonderful human beings, each deeply committed to exploring how can we raise the next generation in order for them to truly thrive. My name is Priya Matani. I'm the creator and producer of Festival of the Child and your host for this series. Our mission is to empower you as you support your child to grow up to be happy, healthy, confident young people, full of hope for the future. Welcome to our community of empowered parents where your voice matters. I'm so grateful that you're here because it is only by coming together that we get to reimagine what raising children in the 21st century looks like. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Christopher Clowder to you. Christopher, welcome. Thank you. So delighted that you're here today. Um, before we begin our interview, I just wanted to share a little bit more about you for those of our listeners who are not already familiar with your work. So, Christopher Clowder is a freelance speaker, educator, activist, and consultant. He was the founding research director of the Botin Foundation platform for innovation and creativity in education, and he's now developing a new program with them called the Arts, Health, and Creativity in Spain. In this role, he and his team produced four international analyses on social and emotional education, covering 21 countries and two publications on creativity. He also lectured at Plymouth University on the arts and the evolution of consciousness for 18 years. From 1989 to 2012, he was the founder and CEO of the European Council for Steiner Waldorf Education and the chair of the Steiner Waldorf Schools Fellowship in the UK. Before this, he was a high, teach, high school teacher in both maintained and Steiner schools for about 22 years. He was the co-founder and is still a director of the Alliance for Childhood, mainly active in Brussels, a member of the International Forum for Steiner Education and a visiting lecturer on many teacher education seminars around Europe. He's also a mentor of various Steiner schools on the rights for all children. He has lectured globally at numerous international conferences and publicly on many educational and cultural themes, as well as Steiner Award of Education, as well as having written many books and articles. He sees his educational work and the theme of lifelong learning as serving to build bridges between cultures, be they educational, political, social, cultural or academic, and creating a sense of solidarity, renewal and understanding for the benefit of humanity worldwide, especially for children through the arts. Christopher, I'm so happy to be speaking with you today. I really appreciate your time. Um, I just wondered, you know, perhaps we could start really at the beginning and could you share a little bit about your own experience of school and childhood? Well, my experience of teaching, if I put it like that, was mm. with the high school with adolescents mainly. And I always enjoyed this challenge because there was always a sense of potential, human potential in these young people. Of course, it's not an easy time of one's life and it mm. can be a challenging at times in the classroom but I always found the challenges awakening and mm. I think the sense of togetherness the sense of a shared journey the sense that I as a teacher was also learning every day was very nourishing although it's some time since I've actually been in a classroom in that sort of context I look mm. back a bit, back to it with a certain nostalgia and still find inspiration from those years with these wonderful young people that I had the privilege to work with. Mm. Um, in my own schooling, I was went through the normal state sector, but I did end up for a few years at a Steiner school uh, in my teens. And again, I look back with sort of gratitude for what I was able to experience there because it helped me develop my skills, which I now employ in speaking. I uh, did a lot on the stage, so I know how to deal with the stage and general artistic elements, which mm. again, I find very enriching in my life now. Mm, thank you. Um, and I'm just, you know, we're, t we're talking today really about um, reimagining childhood and ways of working with children in the changing world we're living in. And I just wondered if you could outline for our listeners 
Why do we even need to reimagine education? What's wrong with what we've already got? I think there's a great deal wrong with the system. The system, you know, schools are full of dedicated, hardworking, idealistic teachers. That's why one goes into the profession anyway. But I think the way that it is viewed on a policy level is mistaken. It's not fit for the times. It's something that's antiquated, anachronistic. It's from the past. It's a sort of mass education system that really doesn't educate for the individualistic aspect of each child. And I'm especially worried now about this dictation of numbers, this idea that everything can become data and data can be managed to manipulate uh, people and children and dictate which direction they should go in. And I think this is extremely unfair because every child is different and every child contains them in, within themselves a potential that it's a teacher's job to recognise and foster and facilitate that becoming process. And the systems that we have now are becoming more and more regimented for achievement only in numerical terms, examinations, tests, um, bureaucracy, league tables, all these pressures. Of course, every child has the right for a good quality education. So something has to be measured. That's true. Something has to be checked. They have to have that right that everything around them is as it should be. That's justified. But I think it becomes almost like a prison, a dungeon in a way, that we don't look out and see what children are capable of. And in the world we're in, it is so turbulent. We've got no idea what our children are going to face. This world changes monthly almost you know we've no idea what we're going to be assorted with and we've got this huge political environmental social problems around the world that we have to share in our common humanity and i feel that education is very narrowly focused because these young people and children are going to have to be extraordinarily creative and courageous and free thinking later in their lives. They're going to lead a very different life than my generation or your generation followed. And they need particular skills, which I don't feel are fostered or properly emphasized in the education we practice in many schools today. Mm. And that's why I'm uh, really uh, fighting for the role of the arts. The humanities and arts are being diminished. We know fewer and fewer students are doing English literature A-level, for instance, in this country. We know that the arts are being sidelined. Music teachers are being pushed out of their jobs in many countries of the world. The arts are being seen as something that you can't measure and are woolly and just a bit of fun at the end of the day, which is not true. I think the arts are intrinsic to well-being. And this is being recognised more and more by artistic cultural organisations like the Arts Council to say that we need the arts for our well-being. But it's not good just saying that's for adults, it's also for children. And I think the children need this quality of expressing themselves, the ability to develop their self-confidence, the joy of confronting a challenge and overcoming it, which the arts supply, just as much as they need the academic subjects, the STEM subjects that we can measure. And I think this is an international problem coming very much through the PISA studies, where countries sometimes feel that they're too low, like Germany, the PISA shock, as they called it in Germany, when they came 32nd. Wow. And they reform education, and Singapore soon, they reform education by only going for what is measurable. But as human beings, that is not the full picture. There's so much of our spiritual and psychic aspect that is immeasurable, an emotional world that also needs its place in schools. So I feel, looking at the world today, I feel uh, we're going the wrong way, basically, that our children need something else to give them the resources to develop their own skills, their own potential for this unknown but certainly very turbulent future. Mm. And um, what do you think are some of the sort of, I know you mentioned that it's a very different landscape than, say, our generations. Um, what, what do you think are some of those differences? Well, the fears are caused by migration, the fears of the other. You know, this we are an interdependent world. We become more and more interdependent economically, socially, uh, technologically in communications over the last you know, decades, much more interrelated, to try and cut oneself off from the rest of humanity by 
becoming sort of exclusive in one's identity. You are you have an identity of your community and the others are pushed away. I think is extremely dangerous in our world. And things are then if we want to tackle environmental problems, of course, we need each other. Regardless of culture, background, uh, religion, philosophy, whatever it may be, gender, whatever, we need each other. And I think this has a, is, a, is a danger of losing that, that we all go to our own fortress where we feel comfortable and don't reach out to the world. And that for children, I think that's a danger. They need their roots in their culture. Of course, they do. They should be proud of their culture, their language, the, you know, the way the countryside, their own culture and roots. But as a tree, they need to branch out into world citizens if we're to, to deal with the question the world faces. I mean, we look at the distinction of animal species. We look at what, what our waste is doing to the oceans and the lands of the world. This is a human problem for all of us. And we can't try and solve it on our own. And I think emphasizing just the, the national narrow element of where we happen to live or where we happen to be born excludes this dimension of international dimension. And it's not a luxury. I found in my career that I've worked internationally for decades. It's a source of strength. There's always that joy of working together internationally because you have to try and understand the other. And we're all so different. It's a mosaic of many different colours. And that effort you make to try, yes, this person has this perspective or that perspective because of their culture, their background, helps unite us as human beings because you have to work at it because we're all stuck in a way with our own upbringing. <laughs> what we were taught stays deep in our soul, really deep, and as part of our identity. But making the effort to try and understand the soul of others is enriching. Suddenly, the world becomes more interesting. Things become more possible. And the joy of combining that effort with others, I think, gives us a unique, unique potential to discover new worlds, to see the world with new eyes. And that, I think, children need help in developing those skills already in schools not too narrowly focused uh, on a sort of bandwidth that excludes all the rest of the world and the environment with it. And that's why I feel the arts play an extraordinarily important role in developing. That's an inner skill. It could be called a soft skill, but actually it's quite, I wouldn't, soft is not the right word. It's an essential skill for what our children are going to have to do in the world. And we know what joy it brings. We know what the enthusiasm it brings. We know how it lightens the world in what could be appear a very dark time i just i just wondered um you know like gov the government in the uk certainly have spent a lot of time and energy cutting arts funding you know if you think about music theater and art yeah. in general what would you say to that I think it's extremely unfair because it leads for the privilege to still enjoy it, to still experience if you're a private school or your family's well off. Yes, you can have music lessons, you can go to drama class, you can go to dance class, of course, if you can afford it. But mm. what about those children where the parents can't afford it? It's pushing it into the voluntary sector, saying, oh, the voluntary sector covers this. And there are wonderful organisations across the whole country working with children in the voluntary sector. But if you can't afford the bus fare <laughs> to go there, or you feel it's not for you because it's a different type of child there, then you get excluded. And those seeds, if they're not planted early, that lasts for life. You feel, this is not for me. This world is not my world. And I think that's a great shame, a deep shame. Think of Billy Elliot and these these sort of mm. films that have shown what that can do to children who come from a not very propitious background because their parents haven't had that opportunity either and that perpetuates generation to generation and it's so unfair and it should be a part of schooling it should be part of the daily experience in a school and it's not that it costs a lot of money it's not that it takes a lot of time that's mm -hmm. a fallacy it can be inserted into a school curriculum quite simply and quite easily. I've been to state primary schools where they've kept the arts and you walk in and everybody's smiling. <laughs> Everybody is smiling. The children come up to you proud of their school. Their poetry is on the wall. Their paintings, they're having a dance class. Something lifts the whole thing up. And we know 
very clearly from all the work I've done with colleagues around the world, all the research in the last 20 years show absolutely definitely if you if you have an arts rich curriculum in a school, the children have better mental health. There's better school attendance. Mm. There's more pro-social and less anti-social behaviour. And they do better academically. This is absolutely clear. They do better academically with all the more heady subjects if they are allowed to deal with the, the heart subjects, the art subjects. So we can show this. And this comes out again and again, everything we've been doing over the last years. But I'm afraid the world in the name of efficiency and accountability, is a bit blind to that. But in that sense, we're depriving our children. And I think it's a child's right, every child's right, whoever they are, wherever in the world, to have an arts-rich curriculum given to them by whoever is providing the educational provision in any country, not just those who can afford it or have the insight to go towards it in that direction. Mm. I'm just I'm just wondering, you know, very practically, how can we affect that sea change, you know, if governments are so bent on not putting monies into the arts? Well, we're not alone in this. <laughs> Nicholas Sirota spoke of it only yesterday, yes, the question of well being and the effect the arts have on well being. It's a growing aspect of our economy in this country. It's very strong, the creative sector, creative and culture sector. I've been to many conferences with activists. I've been very inspired what people are doing in their own area. It can be quite small working with um, immigrant children, traumatized children, children with particular learning difficulties, all sorts of children. People across the whole country are working with this. Many young people are inspired to do this because they can see it's socially regenerative. It helps sort of social cohesion come about, this sharing of experience. And there are many volunteers, and I hope, or I think, that by just sowing the seeds, planting the ideas again and again and again, having the patience to continue this fight, one day it will come through. Education is a matter of pendulums. Okay, You only have to look at education of educational history. It swings one way, then it swings another. Okay, We have to, as activists in this sphere I've been describing, we have to promulgate our ideas like you're doing with these recordings now, any way we can, whether it's books, publications, research, speaking, meeting, conferences, workshops, any way to push the ideas into society, because ideas have power, not just polit politicians that have power, ideas have power. And the way you think about things influences the world. Each individual's thoughts also change things. And I think if we are combined in that process worldwide, we can bring about that change for children's rights. So in some ways, it's just about, well, not just, but it's also about raising consciousness. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of consciousness. I mean, a lot of my teaching uh, when I was at Plymouth University with young students doing working on the teaching training course was about the evolution of consciousness, how different cultures have a different consciousness and how that changes over the millennia. And also how the arts, architecture, music, literature express that consciousness. And that's a wonderfully, how can I say, emancipating idea that this consciousness is constantly evolving. We can't say one is worse or one is better. That's not the point, whether it's Egyptian or Greek or Roman or, or Chinese, not one better or worse. But the, the, this impulse that we have in us to create Every culture is created. Our language is created. The idea of being English or Scottish or Welsh is created. It's mm. an act of imagination. It's all that. Even our economy is actually an act of imagination. These little things we use called coins, they only have a value because we agree to imagine they have a value, which we share. We share imaginations. So I think this capacity for imagination, this sharing of imagination, can bring beneficial change and help us deal with the questions of our world and our social and political questions as well. But it's an enrichment of imagination. And that's why the arts are so important in the school, because they it's a skill. You can although every child has that imagination, I'm afraid a lot of our systems actually suffocate it. <laughs> you know, it's Malaguzzi, the famous founder of Radio Emilia, 
who said, you know, that education is like a funnel. We put the children in and we squeeze them down to what we want them to be. Mm. We said, that's wrong. Every child is a rich child. Children are rich. They have their hundred languages of childhood. The children have this wonderful, imaginative world. If you were a young child, you, you, you lighten up when you play with them, when you speak to them. We all feel that because that's what children give to us. And I think one key to this is an understanding that children are co-creators of our world. They're not the object of our attention. They themselves make a contribution to who we are. And if we're open to what the children bring to us, when they bring their trust, their sense of wonder, their love, their playfulness, these are wonderful childhood gifts that we can also use in adulthood in a conscious way. A child has them unconsciously because they're children. It's unconscious. It's part of their being, what they are. They grow up. We get logical, analytical, different ways of thinking, all the rest of it, fine. But those ones I mentioned, we can reawaken in ourselves. And I think this is the key to a good education. We look at, for instance, wonder. This ability to look at the world and say, that's interesting. That's great. I didn't know that. Wow. And we can do that every day. Everything we look around, even if it's a tree in the garden or the sky in the, in the, you know, the clouds in the sky, anything, we can find, ah, yes, this is wonderful. That's the degree of wonder. And when you have an element of wonder, you have an element of interest. And when you have an element of interest, you can then share the world. Another person is interesting. Another culture is interesting. And once you get to that, it gives you a moral foundation. And the same with the environment. The sense of wonder for the environment helps us respect it, helps us deal with the problems that we are causing, you know, and the Anthropocene and what we're doing to the world. If we keep that, if we can reawaken wonder, and I think that should be the basis of a school curriculum. <laughs> not just you have to learn it, memorize it, do an exam and forget it. It's not that. It's do I have still that wonder in me? And I think that's one basis of the curriculum. The other one I think we also have to in, in develop with our children is compassion, this fellow feeling, yeah, the sharing of humanity with all other human beings on the earth. Mm. I'm quite, and we're losing it in a way because one of the reasons we lose it is because we we have this illusion that we're, you know, if you think about all the screens in our world in our life. We see this, we see that, we see the other, we see the other. But we're not directly involved. We can step back from it. And we can see all the horrible things happening, whether it's in Syria, whether it's on the Mediterranean with the migrant boats, or, you know, in the rainforest, all these things we see happening around us. But because we're just seeing it on a screen, we distance it and feel, mm, I can't do anything about it. An inner feeling of powerlessness. And that's why we need also in the schools to work with children to know that they can do something in the world. They can do something for somebody else. And you can develop that ethos in a classroom, in any community, this ethos of sharing. Yes, I can help you, and I need help. Both those gestures. I need you, and you need me. And that's something, again, that you can build into the way you teach, the way you present a curriculum to the children. And follow these examples too. So I think wonder, compassion, and the third one I say is conscience. Mm. This interesting little voice that we have inside our heads that tells us, oh, shouldn't really have done that or shouldn't do this. Where, what is that voice? Where does it come from? It's a fascinating history, the evolution of conscience, you know, starting in ancient Greece, going through where you have such great figures as Nelson Mandela or Vaclav Havel, people who go to prison for their conscience. Mm. This is wonderful. This is very, this gives me great optimism in a way, that people's conscience is so strong, I will not be manipulated like this. I will stand for something that's true in myself, and I will suffer for it. And I think, again, this sense of, and this wakens up in, you find conscience is something that appears very strongly in adolescence, where young people say, this is not fair. You see, that's that's conscience. This is not fair. 
Mm. And I've had, you know, you've told a pupil off and another student would come and say, actually, that wasn't the right person. It wasn't right. You didn't do that. And as a teacher, that's a great privilege, actually. It doesn't undermine your authority at all. It's the exact opposite that a student can feel they can come to you to say that. It's actually always made me feel great. They can speak to me in that way as a fellow human being. And perhaps I did make a mistake. Perhaps I did do something unfair in reprimanding someone in the classroom and I really wasn't seeing what actually was going on and took the wrong person. And that's conscience. So I feel these are the basic underlying spiritual themes of what schools should be about mm. deeper than all the things we have to know and learn to be citizens of course literacy numeracy it skills mathematics of course we need that absolutely otherwise we can't fulfill our role as citizens of this world but underneath the gesture the soul gesture to each other to the world i think this is the role of schools maybe very unfashionable to say that but you know it's interesting uh, Bauman. A Polish um, exile, a professor of Leeds, died a couple of years ago, said, what has, what has happened to conscience? Where has it gone? And he said, what we've created in our technical world, we've created artificial eyes. We can see everywhere in the world, everywhere, all on our screen, facing us daily. Mm. Our eyes, through our arts, we've created these wonderful eyes. But he said, now we have to create artificial arms artistic arms that hold us, that embrace us, embrace the world, that we can encompass the world in our arms, close to our heart. He said that is what the great moral challenges of our time. And I think that was extremely wise. Yes, he had suffered in Poland as a Jewish person. Uh, he'd gone into exile. He'd been through the terrors of the Nazi regime. And I think he had a very interesting point there, what our task is, and he was able to express it in a very simple way. How do we embrace each other? Mm. Because we need to, because the screen doesn't embrace us. It informs us. Yes, of course. It aims to communicate. Yes, but it doesn't embrace. And this is where we need as much as possible to have this direct human contact with each other in whatever way we can. And the children who have this capacity innately they do. They have compassion, children. They, they feel what the adult world is doing, even if they can't express it. They know in their feeling life what the teacher is feeling or what the, how the adults react to each other. They're extremely sensitive to that. Mm. How do we make that more conscious in our adult life, in the adult life in order to serve the children of today? And I think it's possible to develop a curriculum out of those thoughts. And I think the teaching vocation would be much happier. <laughs> the schools would be much more joyous. I noticed again in Spain, I did this work on, as you said, on 21 countries on social emotional education. And we found the key were the arts. That was the key. Wherever we found innovation, a head teacher or teachers in classrooms that were innovating, it came to the art of teaching, <laughs> the art of being together, the art of being human. Mm. And so the Spanish foundation I work for, the Fundación Botín, then developed a program for state schools. There are now 250 state schools, 7,000 teachers working on this. Wow. And they have the results, which I mentioned earlier, because we evaluated. But there's another result, joy. Mm. When you get, people smile, parents are happier too, because the children bring a bit of joy home with them. And today life is very stressful. You know, people have two jobs, multiple portfolio jobs. Everybody's under pressure. But if a child can bring a bit of joy home from school or go to school joyfully, and it's not that, you know, it's, it could be it's just a few lessons a week. I visited schools. They had, in Spain, it was very intellectual, the education, very sort of French-like, and there were no arts. Now introducing a little choir. They have T-shirts, choir of emotions. <laughs> On your t shirt, and they sing an hour a week. Straight away, there's a difference. Straight away, there's mm -hmm. a sense of belonging. You bring in the music, which is a different sphere of communication, which we know is universal. That's why everybody listens to music every day, all the time. They need the music, but to share it with others changes the school one hour a week. 
And so, you know, we had teachers, we trained, they used to come to training. And out of about 25 teachers, only three had ever held a paintbrush in their lives. Wow. Frightened. <gasps> well, you, know, you can imagine. I've got this thing in the company. One week later, they didn't want to stop. They couldn't stop me. Because they suddenly discovered that we're, every human being is an artist. Every human being has creative skills. So why do we take that away from the children when it's intrinsic to what being human means and can lift us up? Yeah. And I think this is such an important message. So in my work, I try as much as possible to communicate this with examples. I use poetry. I use, you know, art, art, visual arts and things like that, as well as talking about it to try and make it an experience for the listener. whatever. And I feel with, with lecturing, that's very important too. Lecturing is an artistic enterprise. You stand on the stage. Nobody wants you to stand there and read a bit of paper because they can read it themselves at home much quicker. Mm -hmm. Why should they watch you read? <laughs> Needs this sense, and the same with PowerPoint. I'm a PowerPoint abolitionist. I right. <laughs> ever use PowerPoint because I notice what, how it imprisons people. They just read from there and they lose their person. They don't express their personality. And the personality is part of the message. Yeah? Medium is the message. Yeah, the clue. Yeah, we know that. So um, I try and use artistic forms, and every time I give a talk, I try and sense what's happening in the room and follow it through accordingly, take risks. All art is risk. Yeah? And that's perhaps why in our risk-adverse society is mm. why arts are being pushed aside. Art is risk because you don't know where you're going to end up. And human beings, risk is a problem. Okay, I can understand. We like security. We like to know the chair I'm sitting on is really here. What well, my job is there, I'm going to be paid at the end of the month. Or, yeah, we, we, we need that, a sort of shell around us, a form, a structure. Art can, how can I say, can if, change that form in unexpected ways. And this is, highlights a little bit of a danger. But unless we do that, we can't change the world. The world doesn't evolve. It doesn't change. We get stuck in the past. And being stuck in the past is one of the greatest dangers we face. Because that, if we get stuck in the past, is inevitable. We end up with conflict and wars. You can see in the history of the great dictators of the 20th century, how they tried to rebuild Rome, Lenin, Hitler. Mussolini, look at the outside paraphernalia of what they were doing. He was rebuilding the past, going back to the power, the well, mythological power of ancient Rome. This is a huge danger. We can't do that. We have to live in the now, in the present, and work towards a future. And the future is never the past. So trying to catch the past and say, oh, and have a nostalgia for a false past, because the past was pretty horrific. If you look, you study history, you will see that it's not without its awful side of slavery, um, genocide, uh, whatever, whatever. It's, it's, sometimes it just is horrible to read. Even a city like Jerusalem, just read a book on the history, biography of Jerusalem, holy city, but the amount of grief and suffering over mm -hmm. the centuries is awful is awful to them so we do so much harm to ourselves how are we ever going to get out of that how are we going to create a more harmonious understanding peaceful joyous world and i think it's incumbent on all of us who see this that we try in some way in our daily lives too not just in our professional lives in our daily lives try and make a world a better place from a a deeper, it's all from inside. And again, we discover that with social emotional learning. It all comes from inside, <laughs> inside this individual, inside the school community. That we can build something up that's new and refreshing and can bring a bit of optimism to the children and help them feel yes, I have a value. I'm here for a purpose. I've been born to bring something into this world. I don't know what it is yet. But I will find out. I will find my way. It may be a difficult journey, but that's why I'm here. I can bring something. And that's why I also feel that youth unemployment is such a disaster. You know, if you think of countries like Spain, more than 40% of 18 to 24-year-olds have no job. 
and the career <coughs> education, they just left. And this seems to me quite criminal because at that age, when you're full of idealism, you want to offer something to the world and the world says, sorry, no thank you, we don't need you. That lasts for life. So again, I think the arts, if we can involve these young people in the arts, it's well known what it does for people who've had misfortune in their lives, who are, who are illiterate, who end up in, in the sort of prison system, whatever, because they haven't been able to fulfill or find their own potential as children. And I think we could do a lot better than we're doing now if we make a concerted effort and somehow convinced the OECD and World Bank and policy makers and <laughs> education ministers who come and go year after year who have no particular interest in education very often. Anyway, if we can convince them of the importance of this attitude, this gesture, which will manifest itself differently in every school because it depends on the individuals, not on the policies, not on a program. It depends who can be inspired and have the courage to follow these ideas sort of in their own way with their own children. And I would say that it has to be specific. It's not something you can just say, do this, do that. You can show examples. You can say, this person has done this, this person has done that, this school has done that. That's fine as examples. But it has to be sincere. <laughs> it has to come from within. And so we need freedom. We need the freedom from the schools and the teachers to be trusted as professionals in a very untrusting world at the moment, mm. to be trusted again as professionals and to be assisted, to help, to find that better part of their nature and the better part of being human that they can then explore with their children. And I'm just, you know, speaking about teachers a little bit more, I'm just thinking about how can we better support teachers? Are there any specific practices that can enable them to be more empowered in their vocation, for example? Uh, yes, we can, because we can enable teachers to find the artist in themselves. Mm. And this is done. We can have workshops, um, conferences, uh, speakers, uh, whatever. Men are bringing arts into the schools themselves. Artists are always happy to come into schools, give demonstrations. There was a lovely one I saw, a little video called The Red Bus. I don't know if it still exists. These actors brought a red double-decker bus into the school playground invited the children to sit there and one of them brought up a cup of coffee into the bus and another actor knocked him and knocked the coffee over it and the children were watching this bit. and the actor then lost his temper and screamed and shouted and shouted at the other one and they <laughs> friction then said children wait they did it again and then they didn't have that conflict they apologized and and they asked the children which was the best, which did they think was the best way. And the children had a big discussion. Some felt, you know, if somebody does that to you, you fight back on the other. But again, it was just a way of opening up. In those that school, those schools they went, they found a decrease in bullying in the schools afterwards. Mm. Across the school. Because children suddenly realized that, you know, having a conflict like this doesn't solve it. Or there's the roots of empathy in Canada which I think is an amazing program, where a mother brings a baby into a classroom. Children sit in a circle in primary school, and mother brings a baby, just holds a baby. The children look and talk about it. The next month, she comes back and brings her baby. And for the children, this is a wonder, and it becomes their baby. <laughs> Every month, they see that change, that baby. Mm -hmm. Bullying goes down. Your teachers are more happy in the school. Power of a baby. This is, um, it's teaching, as, this, as the organizer said, I think said, uh, compassion is not taught, it is caught. Mm. And so the children then, through that experience, you're not preaching to them, you're not saying thou shalt not or thou shalt, just that experience of this lovely little child growing month by month with the motherly love in the center of the classroom, each month, their baby, watching, wakens something in their heart. This is not rocket science. It's, it's not going to cost anything. And it could be done in every school. And they have now seen in all the schools where that takes place in Canada, a decrease in bullying. 
So I think these are the skills we have to learn. And there are many, many examples across the world of this that we can learn from each other, how to work towards that. And I think the teachers need that freedom to explore. You know, the curriculum is so intensive now, so narrow. You have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, you have to have this score, you have to measure, you have to know every child's learning progress, etc. It needs a bit of space. It needs breathing, a breath. <laughs> we breathe oh. in and we breathe out. And I think a lot of our schooling is a lot of breathing in. And is it no wonder that we get allergies, asthma, uh, ch mental stress, children's mental background, increasing suicides, endless stressfulness. Let's breathe out. Let's put that into the schools too. And I think everybody would benefit. In my son's um, school, they have a school dog which is a sort of well-being dog, which I think plays a similar role to the yeah. mother and the baby. Yeah, the horses are used as well. All sorts of animals can be used as well, yes. Mm. Yeah. But we, the teacher needs, the school needs that ability to explore that and that possibility and to be left with trust, yeah, <laughs> to mm. do that. Of course, there'll be, with, when you do things like this, you make mistakes, but that's life. We, we fail. <laughs> often mm. enough but the, the point is to learn from them that's the essential element can we learn from those mistakes we make mm. I, um, I just read something you'd written about that for teachers it's not enough for teachers to love children but they also have to love the vocation yes just wondered if you could share a bit more about that with us <sighs> teaching is a privilege <laughs> as I said I still well, after so many years it, in my mind, God, those young people, those experiences, I reflect on it and I find that a source of strength and yeah, keep going, actually, after all this time, not give up. Um, yes, teaching is an art. It is an art. How you stand, how you talk, what words you use. You imagine you're there being watched the whole time. People, or unless they've got their arms on their desk and they're falling asleep, which also mm -hmm. happens, of course, which is natural in adolescence. Um, you're being watched. You can see their eyes. They're watching. And they're saying, what sort of human being is this? Am I going to be like that when I grow up? Uh, and if you practice an art, it has its challenges, and you find sometimes you don't know how to overcome them. But when you manage it, it lifts you up. And I still remember, remember the moments when occasionally I got it right. <laughs> I got it right. And the student comes back to me years later and says, you know, that made a difference to me. Now, among all the mistakes I made as well, of course, and which I got wrong. But that's the love of teaching. And I think it isn't just a, a job for people who are not going to make a lot of money or not business minded. It's, it's the future. It's absolutely you're working in the classroom every day with the future. And this is a tremendous privilege. And you, you have a connection to the students for whom you're responsible. As I said, you they can bring, they bring something to you. Mm. That awakens this love. That you have. And love, of course, is the most important human Faculty, then what to call it really, ability. Everything's based on love. Every film we watch, <laughs> or different degrees of love, uh, or ab ab absence of love, the novels we read, the way we live our lives, our family lives, our relationship lives, all our lives uh, have this quality of behind it something to do with love. And I think loving your profession, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a teacher is essential because it stops you getting stale, it stops you getting weary, it brings new life to everything you do and every day it becomes a yeah, you learn something from it hmm. I'm just uh, I was just kind of picturing teachers coming together and you know maybe doing something artistic together you know whether it's as, as you'd said earlier about painting or singing or even telling a story Mm. Telling storytelling is again a much underrated skill, but it's a wonderful skill because again, through millennia, it enraptures us. It, it brings us all together in, in telling storytelling. There are many different forms of art. So many, you know, making a film or oh, whatever. I won't list them, but there's many different artistic. And if we do it together, we 
find each other in a new way. We have a conversation, we make a joke. Uh, it all doesn't become so deadly serious. And our ambitions are a bit, uh, how can I say, suppressed <laughs> to be better than the other. I mean, our school system is based on trying to be better than someone else. All the time, better than someone else. Getting a higher score, get a higher examination, be better, promotion. Um, the main, what I would say, where Steiner education differs very strongly from the normal sector or whatever, state sector, is it's not ambition to be better than the other. It's an ambition to be better in yourself, to do better yourself. This internal ambition is more important than saying, I want to be better than this person. I want to be better than that. I want to rise above the pile. Rather than it's better to say to oneself, I want to do better for myself, to be a better self. And that's a different sort of ambition. And I think through the arts, one can experience that, joining, making a tapestry. I've been to hospitals where the doctors and patients have made tapestry together in Ireland. And the pride with the, with the professionals, as I walked past it or stood in front of it, they said, we made this. And, the, you know, in a hospital, which is very stressful and dealing with very uh, tense situations all day, every day, matters of life and death and pain and sorrow, all these things, they could stand it. We did this together, patients and doctors together. So this mutual creation, this sharing of making, you know, I think is whether it's... And one experience that in school, for instance, when, you, when I did talk theatre, when I did plays with my class, several of my classes, and they had to learn that everybody's important. Even the smallest part is important. You know, whoever, you know, who the dressmaker or the lighting or the prompter or whoever, it all, it all matters. <laughs> and not one, I'm the star because I've got the longest part and this one is the lowest and therefore I make or break a play. It's not like that. It's a communal sharing. And this is interesting to watch how the young people suddenly notice that realize that that they have a shared responsibility that the whole production works together and they all share it in how they treat each other how they speak to each other backstage if they come to rehearsals or not all these things they learn social skills through doing a play very deep and when you ask them after school what do you remember most when you were at school what was the most prevalent memory plays <laughs> having done a theatre production we think oh we did this we did the merchant defenders or whatever it was mm -hmm. that they and school outings because school outing is a huge social enterprise it's mm -hmm. a be learning of things of being together again it's getting lost in our school culture in this country because of fears i think some of them yeah some well-placed but some misplaced fears of taking children to museums and galleries or camping or whatever like that. But that makes a huge impression on young people. If you think, people think back to their schooling, what do they remember? Plays and outings. Mm, That's true. the social experience that you have. You are learning social skills in a very concentrated way, and you remember that. And that shows the schools have another role than just academics and exams. Yeah. This is what has to be there because this remains part of your character, part of your makeup later in life. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this fundamentally collaborative approach, you know, in schools, life for a lot of, pe a lot of people growing up in schools can be very competitive. And this collaborative way of being, even in a school setting, is actually imp an important foundation for caring about one another in the real world later on. Sure. And, and and when that piece is missing, you know, I mean, we can sort of see the results of that fracturedness in society as a whole. I just wanted to um, share, you know, the UNESCO obviously have sustainable development goals. And for 2030, I read that the obtaining a quality education is the foundation to create creating sustainable development. And I was just thinking, well, what do they actually even mean by a quality education? I know you'd spoken about wonder and compassion and conscience, um, but what do you think? What do you think are the defining attributes of a quality education? That we respect the child, and that we learn from that. I don't want to set a paradigm of what it should or shouldn't be. 
Mm. As I said, it has to come from inside. And uh, when we did these these Spanish um, books on social emotional learning across the world, we had a phrase that we used at the beginning from a Spanish poet. We make our maps as we go along. Wow. And that was what we used. That was the thing. We make our maps. We don't, this has to be like this. Because, again, that can be imprisoning. We don't leave ourselves open to what comes. We don't even leave ourselves open to the present. And I think just making our maps as we go along is what we need the courage to do. It's hard. <laughs> you have to have imagination. You have to have courage, inspiration. You have to work. You have to work on yourself. But again, that's life. That's what lifelong learning means. And this is, I think, a wonderful, enlightened, new enlightenment. But we have this concept, lifelong learning. You never stop learning. Your brain never stops developing. Yeah, when I was training as a teacher, it was assumed that your brain was fine until you were about 25. And then from then on, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And then the end, it was useless. And you could never learn anything. We now know it's total and utter rubbish. Mm. Brain is infinitely malleable. It's infinitely creative. Maybe slower, maybe more hard work, but until our last breath, in fact, we can learn. We have to learn without changing bodies. As our bodies get older, they change. We learn to accommodate that. We can learn so much more in our lives as we conscious of lifelong learning. And I think this is a wonderful, emancipatory idea that we've been using that term for the last 20 odd years. But it never stops. And I think that then can give us the courage to follow things through and give us the skills just saying that I life is learning. Teaching is learning. And so one can't say, you must learn this, you must learn that. But help people, work with people to find their own learning path. And for them to say, ah, I got it. I, 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 I've seen something. Now I know from within. <laughs> so I think that's the main rule. That was all our work over eight years and all this, well, more than eight years, all that showed that was possible. And as I said, we now can show it. And these Spanish schools have taken it up with great enthusiasm across the whole country. Mm. It's it's quite profound, really. If I think about, you know, I have a 16-year-old son who's been doing GCSEs. And if I look at some of how he's been asked to respond to questions it's very prescriptive and there's not really much of this love of learning going on in some of his experience and you know he's sort of asked to answer questions in a very specific way and if you think outside of that box your question or your sorry your answer is wrong yeah exactly. and scripted teaching scripted, it's, it's, yeah, it's terrible i mean in some cases i've heard of in, in the states the content of a lesson is printed out for the teacher you've got permitted questions at the end and it says if if question is asked that is not one of these ignore it wow <laughs> can you ignore a child's question and you know this is just boxes in the mind it boxes it's sort of imprisonment that we're a mental imprisonment that we're inflicting on our children and it's so sad it really is sad it takes away their joy of learning it undermines their ability to go on learning for life it destroys their self confidence it restricts their imagination is that what we want the future of the world to be mm. I love what you said about the map. It reminds me, I think, in one of the Harry Potter films, I can't remember the reference exactly, but I'm sure there's a map. And, you know, it literally, your steps appear on the map as you're walking. So it's in real time. So it's literally unfolding as you are. Right. And I just think it's, you know, I think as an approach, it's, it takes a lot of courage, but I think it also maybe takes a lot of vulnerability because it requires an individual to go, actually, I don't know, or maybe I'm getting it wrong. And that's, quite challenging isn't it in today's climate it is but it enables trust <laughs> you know yes you have to go through these challenges and say yes i got that wrong but it enables us to trust ourselves and to trust others and again that's an aspect of the world that's being undermined <laughs> constantly undermined our trust in each other so we put in programs whatever whatever we call them things that you have to do to ensure it's a lack of trust but through trust, we thrive. If you feel you are, the child feels trusted, you know, they can do much more 
Mm. Children can do many more things than we think, give them credit for. They're not very able to take responsibility and find solutions to problems that we would never think of if we entrust them. Of course, you have to be at risk that your trust will be abused. Fine, that happens. Mm. I think we need, we can't just develop trust as an abstract theory of the work with children in that trustful way because if we trust each other we bring out the better nature of ourselves Mm. it's probably a wonderful place to uh bring our conversation to a pause thank you so much for your time i was just wondering if there's anything else that you think parents or teachers should be aware of just some final closing thoughts well i think i've (laughs) debated quite a wide wide now but I think it's all our responsibility I sometimes wonder about this definition of parent or teachers we're all educators mm. educators we educate in different ways according to whether it's a professional school based way or at home with the family but we need to share these experiences there shouldn't a school is a, a network of relationships that's all the school is it's a network of relationships and that includes everybody from the caretaker, the parents, everybody is part of that. And that's where the children learn. So the closer we can define ourselves as having a common endeavour to support and help children and develop the capacities of childhood in ourselves Mm. together, I think the better the community will be. And I think schools are being looked to, you know, the, the role of the church is diminished, the role of different authoritarian institutions is diminished. People turn more and more to the school. That's why Sure Start was such a wonderful idea. I'm so sad it's been undermined since then. But I, I noticed how that lifted up the parents. Parents with very challenging home circumstances mm. felt appreciated and lifted up and part of the community of learning. So I would say I've always wondered, parent, teacher, whether we shouldn't have a, an all encompassing terminology that we share this role with our children together Mm, thank you so much for your time today it's been wonderful and um i look forward to speaking to you another time yeah indeed thank you bye-bye bye wow that was fantastic and another thought-provoking conversation but what did you think we'd love to hear from you what's your one big takeaway from listening to this interview Please do join us over on the Facebook group and let's continue the conversation.